Yes, yeah, so unfortunately, even if Philippe Dufault and I, we have the same first name, we are not the same person. So I will not be able to deliver his, his performance. Uh, but luckily, yeah, he recorded his, his part. Uh, I really wondered how I could introduce uh, these two uh, amazing uh, people. And I tried to think about what are the things that they have in, in common that I could talk about. Uh, first, well, they have funny accents in, in English. Uh, that's first, but you know, it's not really serious. So I thought about perhaps something else, something uh, deeper. Uh, I think these are two people that uh, lived uh, in their shadow of their masters perhaps for too long. Um, and when, uh, when we did the first kind of workshop in, in 2016, I remember we had drinks in town in Toronto and uh, we, we came back to the hotel uh, in a cab. Uh, and I told Ofra, I just saw your TED talk. I mean, uh, I did not expect you to do uh, uh, such a, a, a low thing, you know? Um, and, 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 she, and, and I was like, it really, it really seems to me that you're more and more in, in emancipating from your master. Uh, and I really like seeing this. And, and when people talk about Ofra, well, they use, when people used to talk about Ofra, they would always refer to her master. And I told her in 2016, one day, people will no longer refer to you with your master next to you. Uh, and I think that this day has come. Because for, for, uh, since, since the beginning of this conference, I, at least everybody who talked to me about you never mentioned your master. So perhaps it's a sign that you are becoming our master. Uh, I mean, there is not a single person in this, uh, I think this, this uh, room that has more experience in military design thinking than Ofra and Kasha. As for my colleague, uh, Philippe Dufort, uh, he was also in the, the shadow of his, of his master. Uh, but what he does not realize is that the research he did in Colombia uh, was unique and unprecedented. He spent, he spent months and months with the Colombian armed forces uh, to develop an anthropology of war from their perspective, to look at how they innovated uh, and disrupted their own thinking uh, uh, from a bottom-up perspective. So not, not by taking from uh, ancient Greek philosophy or, or, or whatever. Uh, and it has been several, uh, uh, let's say, years that he was, I mean, there's something there, there's something there. And to be honest, I was not convinced uh, until he brought some Colombian officers in Toronto and until they both went there uh, and experienced uh, something that I will just let you uh, continue. So thank you so much and join me for a warm round of applause. say that I'm truly sorry I cannot be with you at Lancaster. Um, last year I am DC and Ottawa was thrilling. It's always extremely stimulating to be uh, in person, exchange with all those uh, stimulating officers, intellectuals and scholars interested in innovation, interested in design. So uh, I hope next year I'll be able to join, join the community. Uh, due to family reason, I had to remain uh, in Ottawa this year. I'm truly sorry, again. All right, so at this point of the conference, I imagine that even those completely unfamiliar with military design and its community uh, will now have heard quite a lot about the tension between, on one side, a desire to influence uh, and a desire to uh, diffuse the ideas uh, of design within an institution through a formal doctrine and on the other side, a purer, or let's say the purest uh, vision of design, which refused being codified. This brief uh, presentation aims at uh, returning to this debate uh, and offering a way to transcend, uh, to transcend this debate in order to inspire dialogues that are less about who owns and real design, um, and talk about, let's say, forms of practices that are related to design, but can be differentiated uh, relative to different levels of war. Let's use uh, this expression uh, for this uh, presentation. So my share of this uh, co-presentation with Ofra is really to introduce and talk about the Colombian context. 
Um, in November 2018, I had the privilege of co-organizing a special seminar for uh, Colombian generals and colonels on operational design. Um, I invited uh, Ofra Geischer and uh, Mathieu Primo um, during this trip to <coughs> Colombia. And we had the occasion to talk about, uh, of course, design, innovation, but also I could uh, introduce them to what has become my second reality, my second world, uh, the, the Colombian military uh, context. Uh, I've been studying that context for uh, the last 15 years, and um, it was really rich to talk with Ofra and Mathieu about design and journalship. And I think some of the ideas of those exchanges will be stimulating uh, for you in Lancaster. I have to say, obviously, that most of the idea I present here are the result of those uh, exchanges are not solely uh, mine, obviously. Another point uh, before entering into uh, into uh, the, the, the content of this presentation, uh, I need to apologize for this uh, never-ending uh, subtitle to this conversation. Uh, I take full responsibility uh, for it. Um, but I think that for those of you who read um, Candide by Voltaire, you may see the value of including such a reference. When Candide visits uh, the Utopia of El Dorado, what happens there is uh, that Voltaire creates a fascinating world, but keeps the European, or let's say the Western public in mind. Candide's uh, voyage enlightened us on the shortcomings of our visions, of our communities. The idea of El Dorado is really a perspective uh, that we can gain on our own practice. The idea of gold, in fact, in El Dorado, uh, the, the beginning of this uh, metaphor started when Ofra uh, gave me her book, an excellent book, um, in 2016 when I met her in Toronto. And she wrote as a dedication to Philippe, good luck, on your Latin explorations, may you find gold, Ofra. Well, it's funny how um, destiny works. Um, two years later, uh, Ofra, Mathieu, and I, we were in Colombia, in El, El Dorado, uh, of um, what I call, let's say, the, um, um, a, a very special site for innovation. And I'll let you um, know more in detail why I think Colombia is special for military innovation, or what other people would call design. My presentation will cover the Colombian context. I will say a few words about their military history, but the real point here is to talk about their military officers, um, how they are special due to their very long experience in war. I'll talk about my research on reflexivity, and I will link it with design and say why it's an upward, but I would say stimulating encounter. The key points of this presentation is about Colombia. What are they doing right? Why is it so important for the design community what is happening in Colombia right now? And also, why was it so stimulating to bridge the Israeli experience with the Colombian uh, experience? What happened there? Why was it uh, stimulating and important for our current debates? So to talk about the Colombian context, um, it's difficult, it's extremely complex, obviously, but I would use one figure, let's say, to exemplify uh, what happened in Colombia in the recent years. Um, you will see on this photo here, General Enrique Mora Arangel uh, interviewed uh, these officers uh, many times for my, my research. Um, when he took command of the Colombian Armed Forces in 1998, um, it was difficult, a dire situation at strategic level. I uh, share with me um, here, this is a document from the FARC in Irla. Uh, they were all around the capital, all around Bogota. And um, at this point, if you took your car and you wanted to go to the countryside, you needed to pass several checkpoints. The first one being one of the Colombian army, the second one being the FARC, the third one could be uh, right-wing paramilitaries, and the next one, um, the police. The territory was completely fragmented. Um, the CIA wrote at this point that if we do nothing within six months, the capital and the government will probably fall. 
Um, so this was not a good moment for the Colombian military forces. The morale was extremely low. And when um, General Mora Rangel uh, took command, it's extremely interesting what he did. Most of the time, this history is um, told from, let's say, an American perspective, saying that uh, Plan Colombia allowed for an increase in capability and professionalism within the Colombian armed forces, and they were able to uh, reverse the situation or to change the strategic balance. But on my side, um, I, I, I want to underline the critical role of the Colombian officers. What happened in those, let's say, 10 years is spectacular. In 98, this is the situation. In 2008, 2012, this situation is completely different. We have um, a Colombian military uh, in control, having the strategic advantage and the capacity to, to start peace talks, um, you know, with the FARC on their knees. So they are, uh, they are um, the one with the initiative and they are the one with the advantage. So what happened in between the two? We truly need to understand what uh, generals such as Mora Rangel uh, did. One example, uh, Mora Rangel, when he arrived, the first task, first task he accomplished was really to rewrite, rethink, reconsider um, the narrative that would be used by the military to understand the war, to plan operation, and to think of themselves in terms of their own identity. Uh, so that was um, extremely structuring, but it is, um, let's say, suppressed by most of um, the military history of the Colombian conflict. But this is central. And many other officers like that um, in Colombia have extremely interesting legacies for Western military thinking, and I think we should dedicate more time uh, to them. The point today is to say that um, the Colombian War is difficult and it has been, uh, let's say, it started in 64 officially with um, the, 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 the appearance of the FARC, but we can go back uh, in 48 with uh, the La Violencia, uh, another period, uh, so 1948 for the true beginning of violence in Colombia. So. What is important, it's not really about the Colombian context, but about what that context did to the Colombian officers. Uh, most of them, in fact, all of them were born in the Colombian War um, since 48. Um, they were raised as kids in war zones, or at least with the risk of violence and um, being uh, witnesses to this um, all what can occur in a theater of war. So when they arrive as officers, they live as uh, civilians for many years. So if they start at 16, 17, uh, their career, um, they have 16 or 17 years of experience in a theater of war, and this would be true for the rest of their life. So they have an intuitive uh, understanding of the complexity of any kind of situation that is associated to uh, war. So the economic, the social, the cultural, all the mundane, um, the daily uh, aspects of uh, a specific, uh, a specific uh, context or operational environment, we could say this is, this is um, natural for them. They think in this way because they have experienced it um, hundreds of times. So when you see this in other uh, countries, officers will go on tour, and they have received uh, personal military education, hybrid warfare, and the rest. But for Colombians, um, this is very easy. This is very easy. And this is gold for uh, design. Complexity is tacitly uh, acquired uh, since their very uh, first years. So we have officers in Colombia that are ready to deal with complexity. In fact, they have been dealing with complexity since a long time. Um, what can we do with this um, is really the point of my own um, research is to, uh, let's say, dig for gold, <laughs> look for gold, um, but trying to make this knowledge explicit. What they they haven't been doing, they are starting to do it, but not that much. 
Um, this is to say to translate tacit knowledge into explicit form of knowledge that can be brought into prior personal military education diffused within their own institution. Uh, so this is my goal in this. Um, since 15 years, 10 years, I've been working on this in Colombia. All right, so I have done a very, very rapid introduction to a Colombian context and also to the specificities and the richness of uh, military thinking in uh, Colombia. Now, my point, and this is what I would like you to uh, focus on in the last few minutes uh, of my presentation, um, how can we link this unparalleled war experience and the richness of their thinking of this association? Um, I just want to say how disappointed Philippe was, and it really was uh, sad that he couldn't be here. Um, so I'd really appreciate it if you have any questions that you email me, um, and I will directly send them to him because I want him to feel involved. Because he, um, you know, it was a, he was he founded last year and helped with this year, and he couldn't be here. So I'd really appreciate any questions to be sent to me or to Mentimeter. Yeah. Um, we're going to take a, a break as if he were here and <laughs> like a normal natural break and then come back and offer is next. Okay. So uh, that was me not doing Voltaire. I'm Israeli. We don't read Voltaire. I did, I did have to, at one point in my life, read Robert Frost. And where is Richard? <coughs> Talked about curiosity. Definitely, if you take the road less taken, less traveled by, it will make all the difference. So I think Philippe Dufault is covered. I know Sonke is not comfortable with what he heard, and maybe some of you aren't as well. In the session of Q&A comments, arguments, and <laughs> observations, uh, I will try my best to answer also for Philippe, but you can talk to him directly. So uh, Miss Ensign, that's for Anders. I mean, where I come from, some of it you already heard. OK, I'm Israeli. I work in the Israeli Defense Forces, and I train generals. Uh, that was my humble start. It's me here, female training snipers. Um, they're not. There are only two female one-star generals in the IDF out of 100 generals. Uh, so even in the generals course, uh, it's still an anomaly. Um, I was a film student. Didn't graduate, but I was a film student <laughs> studying design in the Academy of Art in San Francisco in Columbia College Hollywood, uh, majored in uh, cinematography. Uh, I'm a scholar. I have three and a half degrees. Uh, that's my PhD that Philippe uh, mentioned uh, on operational design, operational arts, deep operations, and special operations uh, with General Ward Wingate. Um, and I'm also Israeli. Now, being an Israeli here, I would say one thing that came last week in a conversation that I made with someone which is Israelis are disproportionate people to an extreme. Um, <laughs> and an example is that last week we sent a spacecraft to the moon. And we're going to be the fourth country, if we make it in two months, to land a spacecraft on the moon. Private enterprise, not uh, government mm -hmm. enterprise. And finally, yeah, that's uh, in the last 15 years, <laughs> I train generals for a living. Uh, that, for me, is, we're saying design purists. Part of me being a design snob is that I only work with generals, which uh, takes me out of the whole planning design problem equation and convincing people uh, we only work with the seniors and the generals. I put this picture here because uh, on the left, uh, first of all, uh, cultural thing, cult organizational culture. Uh, what do you see in the picture? Uh, okay, we have... Two paras, paratroopers, and one Golani Brigade, Gadi Eisenkot. Golani Brigade is the heavy infantry uh, brigade who's mainly operating in the north. Okay? He's the outgoing chief of general staff. Aviv Kohavi is the incoming chief of general staff. In the middle is Amir Baram. He's the commander of the general's course and is going to be the next incoming uh, North Front commander. And all of them were my students at some point or another in their military career. And the last thing I'm going to say about my missing sin is that uh, they say that Israelis live in a movie. Now, in English, it doesn't translate well from languages. So some people say, well, it's, living in a movie is like living in La La Land. 
or living in a movie is like being in a matrix. Um, I would say it's all about level of awareness, meaning are you living in someone else's movie that someone else had directed or produced, or are you the movie maker or movie director? And for us, designers are movie makers. Okay? They are creating movies for other people, either to watch or to play or to participate. So um, yep, we also live in a movie. OK, so since uh, we've seen the last day and a half that a lot of us use movies as metaphors, analogies, and ways to explain stuff, and it's no coincidence because it's the sub, right? It's like the subconscious of our you know, culture, uh, like Carl Jung said, or Joseph Campbell's in Power and Myth. So I'm going to use also a lot of uh, movie analogies here. Um, and, but I think of the IMDC thing as an ongoing if it's not this one movie, definitely prequels and sequels of, of a series of events that started in a very humble, it was a humble workshop. workshop. Just two years ago in Toronto, we were, I mean, that's our, Ben, I don't think you're in the picture, right? Yeah, so yeah, there's. I don't have a beard. I don't <laughs> know where I put it somewhere. But that was more or less the people who were in Toronto. Now, the Toronto is not even the beginning, because the beginning was Philippe Beaubossard coming to Israel because he wanted to know about operational design. He spent there how much, how much time? Two months. Two months. He didn't leave one, one stone unturned in his quest to interview everybody could, <laughs> meet with everybody who was there. And, the phone. Right? And at some point, Shimon Aveh was driving him around in Israel. So basically, it started with Philippe, and then these two Philippes, again, just a person, two people, initiative that developed into that, uh, which for me was uh, a great opportunity, again, to come out of the shadow. So what was my motivation when I went to this workshop? Now, I didn't know what to expect, right? I'm not part of the cabal. I'm Israeli. I'm detached. I mean, some of the people here I know, some of you I know by name, but I never, you know, mixed uh, with you. So my motivation was, um, first of all, to do that. Yes, it was also political. I wanted to show where systemic operational design is, what we're doing right now, how it evolved from 95, or uh, maybe the first year that it was introduced uh, to the States, what the late 90s. By the way, the person who was our first mentor in this quest was Andrew Marshall. Now, Andrew Marshall, Andy Marshall, again, the legendary director of the Office of Net Assessment, he's the embodiment of METIS for me in the US. I mean, and remember METIS, I mean, there was a comment before in the morning, METIS comes from the military. So don't tell me that militaries can't do METIS. <laughs> it is a military word. And Andrew Marshall, who is, again, the embodiment of METIS, that's how he took over, I mean, won the Cold War with the Soviet Union by doing METIS. Andrew Marshall was quoting Francois Julien in the late 90s. He introduced us to Francois Julien 20 years ago. So Metis is there. You need to choose, you know, choose if you use it or not. Okay? So when I came, yes, it was political. I wanted to show how it evolved, SOD. Um, I, I mean, the seizing the high ground, right? Um, I traced the genealogy. Again, I'm not going to it in detail. Go to Archipelago of Design, the website, and you can see all the videos, you can see all the presentations. I encourage you to do that. Um, some key uh, ideas that I talked about were the notion of drift, uh, degrees of freedom, self-disruption, strategy, our Z model, the way we do, that's, that's our design inquiry, that's what it looks right now, um, and again, how it applies to operations. The atmosphere in the workshop was we few, we happy few. <laughs> and then some of the takeaways were, again, very, uh, very surprising for the, again, for two people event, was we formalized the community of practice. Uh, they started the website and, and joined publication, all thanks to your mutual effort, Philippe and Philippe. And then, but Toronto was also the place where I met the Colombians. You can see here Colonel Rojas as well. Uh, and the moment we connected, really, because I speak very little Spanish, uh, was when, uh, <laughs> in relation to someone, something that was said in the room, I explained that uh, emancipation is war. 
Emancipation is not something that comes lightly to anyone. And there were some Canadians in the room who had a hard time with this, uh, with this notion. So uh, that was the prequel recap of uh, 216. And that's the sequel in Ottawa uh, last year. And my motivation when I came to Ottawa a year after, again, a huge event, I mean, for those of you who were there, um, my motivation was to explain where I think, after I praised SOD in Toronto, I was going to talk about why SOD is not succeeding, why we don't have enough statistics to prove that it is working in the real world. And again, it was touched already yesterday, this problem. Um, so that was one motivation. I called it the three inconvenient truths. Uh, why the simulation of design, especially in the senior levels, is uh, still dwindling. Uh, we can't attribute successes. Uh, there is a reduction of the original approach. Remember, the re original approach embraced operational art. I don't know how many people who are doing design now really understand operational art, not just systems. Um, and then to remind everyone of the dark side. Now, the dark side is also an embodiment of the idea of Metis. You can't do design if you don't go to the dark side. Uh, a totally Yoda thing, he was right. Um, the whole positivist notion, uh, the whole playing by the rules, uh, the whole we're not challenging the directive. Uh, Jeremiah, you said before, Jeremiah, Jeremiah, oh. you said that, <laughs> you said outside, you said uh, someone asked you something and you said there is a national security strategy, right? We have the white paper, uh, there are the interests there, and obviously any. Any strategy that is published, any national interest that is published in an unclassified manner is not strategy. To the best sense, it is strategic communications. Uh, and to the best sense, uh, it is supposed to either lead or mislead <laughs> some people. But definitely us, the military, the designers, know that you cannot use it. You can deconstruct it and figure out what they meant implicitly. So that's also going to the dark side because you are given a directive, right, a formal directive, but basically you are supposed to deconstruct it. So that was another motivation of mine. Um, and, and again, to take the idealism out of the room a little. So um, some, again, key ideas that I talked about. Uh, I talked about why the special operations community, or again, the concept of special operations, is prone to systemic operational design, why these two ideas need to be expressed more fully, so I'm, I'm happy that that's what you're doing right now. Um, other stuff I talked about, again, Yoda was right, uh, and to remind us that the essence of design is to betray the model and not repeat it. Uh, our courses every year are changing, not just because the people are changing, not because we're changing and advancing, but also we know that if we try to repeat an event in the course, it's doomed to fail. Uh, why? Because we already have a notion in our mind of how it's supposed to play. Uh, that's one of the reasons we have to keep changing our courses. And at the end, to remind ourselves that strategy, again, going back to my uh, movie analogy, strategy is a good story, strategy is a good argument, strategy is a good movie. And if it's failing, then you know, it's going to flop not just with your peers, with your bosses, but also in the outside world. So that were my uh, motivations, some key ideas. Uh, the atmosphere in Ottawa, uh, again, my impressions, obviously, was that uh, the world is our oyster. Everybody is doing design, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it came to a point, and we're all in agreement, which I'm always, all the time, trying to challenge you. I don't think we're all in agreement. Let's find out where the disagreement is, because that's how we are going to evolve as a community of practice. At the end of the last day, we had the weird, weird discussion. Walter, I'm pointing at you, because it's, that's how it started, where we, dis we thought, who are the people we are going to invite next year? And then we started talking about who is going to be interesting, who is going to be interesting to hear what they think about these ideas. And then the Russian and the Chinese came up. Do you remember the people who were there on that Friday morning? And then Ben and I, we kind of like, well, SOD is a weapon. You don't give a weapon to your rivals. So that was a really weird discussion off, like off road. I mean, at the end of the conference, when we're thinking about next year. So anyway, I'm giving you also that as a thought. You know, if SOD is a weapon, who are you sharing it with? 
And then we go to this year. Um, I think Philippe uh, Dufault, we're going to call him Philippe D because Philippe Bibi is sitting here. Um, <laughs> or the Colombian Philippe, as I call him sometimes. Uh, that's one graffiti that I saw in Bogota on the day that they allowed me to walk outside. They were very afraid of my security, so I had shadows following me everywhere. Um, I'm Israeli, you know, I, I bite, but still. Uh, so, <laughs> so anyway, here is, again, Philippe uh, touched it in his uh, video, but I'm going to uh, uh, remind you again. He was talking about Colombia entering NATO or aspiring to enter into NATO um, and show its worth. In order to do that, Colombia is trying to become a regular military. For me, it sounded absurd that they are giving up all their intellectual capacity and their um, advantage as fighting guerrilla warfare or irregular operations all this time. You know, in all their geography, they only have one area of operation where it can, they can uh, deploy one, ar one armored brigade. That's it. The rest of their, <laughs> the rest of their uh, areas of, of operations is all about infantry and special operations. That's all they can use. So now they're trying to build a force that's going to be only applicable for NATO missions or for missions outside their scope. Um, they're, go they're trying to become a regular military. And what I told them when I got there, that Israel is trying to do the exact opposite. We've been fighting all these years regular operations, regular wars, industrial wars. We have, in the last 20 years, gone into mostly irregular warfare against non-state entities. So we're trying to become more tiger, but the Colombian tiger is trying to become a NATO cat, sheep, <laughs> cow, horse, whatever you decide. Dolphin, Chihuahua. Chihuahua, I'll take Chihuahua. <laughs> so that was one thing, I mean, one agenda in the conference. The second agenda, as Philippe mentioned, was um, really the very, um, very serious effort to develop, for the first time in Colombian history, a doctrine. And they're doing it step by step. They're going to have all the doctrine. They have their American, as Philippe Dufour mentioned, they have American... Um, officers helping them writing the doctrine. Uh, we've also become their friends. And when we got there, the apostles of design, the Americans beca became very uh, uneasy. Uh, they were trying to physically do a buffer between us and the Colombian generals so we don't stain them with design ideas when you can do design through methodology. But that was also in the agenda to sell. I mean, there was the whole ceremony of selling the agenda of, of the doctrine and to do uh, design in doctrine, okay, the ADN, the Colombian ADN. And then that was the tension. So, okay, we, first of all, I was very impressed when I saw the Israeli flag with the Canadians, the Americans, and the Colombian flag, uh, just one person in the room. Felt like the Olympics when we only have like maybe one medal that we're going to uh, win. So there is a heavy, heavy American presence, right, in the Colombian armed forces and in Colombia. Um, there is a presence of Canadians in, in Colombia, even because of, not just because of Philippe, uh, but there were Philippe and Mathieu. And then there are the Colombians. So, key players in the movie, in the Bogota uh, sequel. Uh, Rojas, uh, what Philippe didn't say about Rojas was he's a colonel. Um, we don't know why he wasn't promoted to general. We can only speculate, uh, again, Colombian context. Uh, but don't get me wrong, this guy has more influence in the Colombian armed forces than a three-star general. He managed to bring all the key players in the Colombian armed forces, including the chief of the general staff, the deputy chief who just replaced, has become the new chief of general staff, the commander of the army, the commander of the navy, they were all there. I guess most of them didn't know what design was until they came to the conference or were never interested in it. He managed to bring them to this place. It was a very formal uh, event. Um, so that's uh, he's an intelligence guy, and he's, he's also an embodiment of Metis. And then uh, our new hero, one of our revelations, uh, General Mejia, the commander of uh, the military, uh, who is just retired. And I'll quote him later, and you'll see why we got so excited. 
So what I did uh, in my presentation there, uh, I took them through, again, the generic institution life cycle, right? We develop concept, uh, we build uh, the force, and we employ it in operations. It's supposed to be very fluid. It's supposed to be what we do all the time. Uh, there's supposed to be some rhythm to it. In the middle, we write doctrine and stuff. That's how we're supposed to operate. Um, but generals are all, also live in four paradox, under four paradoxes. And again, it was mentioned already in the talks today and yesterday. The first one is how do you understand reality that is ever flowing, right? Is ever moving. The second one is how you study a future that no one knows. We talk about foresight. We're talking about scenarios. How do you do that? How do you do something that no one knows if it's going to work or not? Uh, taking, again, the roads less traveled. The third paradox is how you understand reality as a system that you are part of, that you are influencing with your actions and ideas. And the fourth paradox is how you understand the whole system and not just the part, and you do it simultaneously, and not getting to the spaghetti map of General McChrystal, who said, when I understand the map, I will win the war. So how do you do this institution life cycle when you have these four paradoxes? And we're still supposed to deliver as generals to come up with a strategy and to translate it to an operation. It doesn't work. And how do we know that it doesn't work? Because we cannot define victory anymore. We're having problems defining decisions. We're having problems defining the entry point. I mean, it's all cyclical. It's like the chicken and the egg. What came first, right? And in these perpetual conflicts that have been going on forever. So what could the Colombian Armed Forces take from our experience with SOD? Uh, and then I took them uh, through a journey that I'm, I will not take you now. <laughs> but basically, I, I tried to come up with like three periods of three equations. And I divided our operations over the years to three layers, OK? This kind of a genealogy. So there were the regular wars there on the top. There were special operations at the bottom. And in the middle, everything that you couldn't put a definition on, which here I call irregular. What I, what is the, what the ones that have a red frame around them are the one when we decided and we won. Okay, so we have 1948, 1967, 1973, and all the special operations. The ones that don't have a red frames are one that we lost, or one that we, uh, we were drifting. I mean, this was, again, that's a 72 massacre in the uh, Munich uh, Olympics of our 12 uh, athletes, that was a key to developing a special operations community in Israel. Okay? And all these special operations kind of answered that or took revenge again, <coughs> however you want to call it. But you can see that the, uh, the, as the years go, and these are the beginning here of the intifadas with the Palestinians, and these are the intifadas with the Palestinians before uh, the state was, uh, it's, these are the 30s. Okay? That's, that's my Ord Wingate thing. So, OK, we win regular wars. At some point, we start losing regular operations. They're not wars. These are the operations in southern Lebanon against Hezbollah from the 90s. We're doing good or special operations. But remember, when I'm saying special operations, I'm meaning one-time operations, sui generic. You only do it once. You prepare for it in advance. Uh, and you usually succeed. That's uh, the bombing of the nuclear uh, facilities in Iraq. Uh, we did it again in Syria in 2007. So we're pretty good at that. We're good at regular wars. And the rest of it, we suck. And so one more thing maybe that I'll say about this slide, that when it was easy, you could do like an, an sort of a equation, OK? Looking at the logic of the enemy and the form of operation, people were mentioning how do you understand the logic of enemies uh, today and yesterday. So here is a very easy equation. You know, I mean, you, under, you, see, you see the enemy, first of all. You know it's logic because regular wars, enemies, basically symmetric wars, we more or less think the same. You have doctrine. Your enemy has doctrine. Intelligence, again, covers both of them. And usually, you can decide. It gets complicated when you have more of those kind of hybrid warfare, uh, logic of the enemy, question mark, uh, forms of operations, question mark, 
Uh, obviously, I'm laughing. I don't think there is hybrid doctrine or hybrid decision. Okay. But the, again, special operations were doing pretty well. Stuxnet, according to for, foreign sources, we had something to do with it. Uh, <laughs> uh, these are the operations in the Golan Heights at the beginning of the uh, war in Syria. Uh, we were doing humanitarian operations that developed into information operations, again, according to foreign sources. Uh, but we were doing a good job at that. And that's the bombing of the nuclear site in, uh, in Syria. Okay, so. Basically, this equation doesn't work. And then I offer them, uh, since that's where we're going, we're only going to see hybrid conflict. I mean, here you have the flags of the states, but here you have the flags of their proxies, right? So Hezbollah, Lebanon, you know, you have uh, Iran and Quds, Al Quds, and you have the Palestinians and their Islamic Jihad and Hamas. They're doing the dual hatted game, but we as Aspiring Western countries are very bad at it. So we find ourselves in perpetual conflict. Again, this was already mentioned why it's not working. This routine peace war thing, uh, binary, or what we call in Hebrew routine war and then a state of emergency. Now, Israel has been in a state of emergency since 1948. But, so why does our chief think that this conceptually is going to explain a soldier where he's at if he's all the time in an emergency state of affairs. We find ourselves in three, three types of conflicts. There are either never ending mazes, I think most militaries here can identify with that, things that we don't know how we're gonna get out of politically or uh, strategically. There are some new emergencies like ISIS, uh, and we want to look for alternative horizons stuff that we can do before it becomes a problem. Remember, I talked about emergencies. <coughs> and at the end, I just offered uh, a new simple equation. Logic of emergence times design will give us the clue to how to disrupt ourselves and then to disrupt our rivals and our reality to go to a desired state that we want. So that was my pitch, and then we went to a workshop. Now, Philip said, the first day were a couple of uh, presentations, and then we divided into the second day into two groups. One group did with the Americans, ADM, in a scenario, they did it all day, they had their uh, products, they were very happy with it. The other group, the more senior uh, colonels and generals uh, that were there in the conference, worked with us doing the Z model, the Israeli systemic operational design. Um, and I can share with you, obviously, the insights. They're classified. But I, I can tell you that what we saw, as Philippe uh, Dufault said, we understood their complex realities. Uh, we understood their complex political military relations. Um, again, there are some militaries here that I know of. Uh, also, finding societies uh, not in sync with the military and politicians not trusting the military, uh, definitely. We can see Trump talking about the, trashing the intelligence community. I mean, so they have their own problems, which again, throws them into the design, throws them into cunning, both, again, the blue side and the red side. Complex rivals, complex international stance, they want to become a part of the Western sphere, but they carry the burden of, again, legitimacy or illegitimacy. And other places in Israel where I felt comfortable with, um, and then this whole love-hate relationship with the West, okay? The Colombians are people who have poor people materially, but they are rich people intellectually. And I think at the end of the workshop, that's what we were trying to convey to them. Don't give up your, in your intellect is a resource, is an asset in itself. Your knowledge about irregular operations um, and dealing with guerrilla movements, uh, negotiations, and fighting them is an asset in itself. Don't try to become westernized. Maybe that's not the right way for you to go. So that was part of what came out of this design exercise that we did with them. Um, OK, so at the end of the two days, the end of the three days, uh, what, what, what were the takeaways from uh, Colombia? Um, and the first one, uh, I will quote uh, General Mejia. General Mejia, again, the chief of general staff, I can tell you that 
for us in the general's course to bring our chief to the course in Israel is a, is a big deal. I mean, usually he says that he's going to come and then he doesn't show up. Colonel Rojas managed to bring the chief both to the opening, I mean, to give the directive to the workshop, but also to give the ending to the workshop. And in the ending, General Mejia said, he said why Colombia needs design. And he said, first of all, because of the complex, again, he said it in Spanish, much, sounds much better than I did, that's my translation. But he said, first of all, it's the complexity of the strategic environment. Everything is closely connected. The military must understand it as a whole and have a comprehensive vision because they have trafficking, they have illegal mining, they have extortions and kidnapping, they have money laundering, they have economic warfare against guerrilla, and they have sensitive political and military relations. So it's a rhythm of reality, a demand for help from government on many civilian issues. I mean, the government goes to the military and asks them to intervene in non-strictly military operations. Um, and give support to the police, which is also a very delicate issue uh, institutionally. And then he said, uh, we need design in Colombia because we're dealing with concepts and threats that are not traditional military against your organizational DNA. For example, a brigade that protects the environment, okay, or a brigade that fights illegal mining. The first re reason Colombia needs design, he said, was in order to align military plans with available resources. Again, I said there are poor people uh, materially. And then finally, he said they need a design because current design on burning issues feel like straitjackets. We need to change the dynamics of conflict. So that is what he said. And then he went on stage and he drew that. Now, they may seem simple to you, and maybe I'm over-reading to it. I'll accept that. But he drew these three circles first, and then he did an X on them. And he said, well, no, for me, strategy and operation, again, he said it in Spanish, strategy and operations are intertwined. I cannot differentiate them. I'm, 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 I cannot say that you are doing strategy separately, operations separately, and tactics separately. I need to find a way to do that together. And that's where he saw design or strategic operational design came into effect because as we know, ADM does only operational design. So that was another interesting thing that he said. And then at the end, he said, how do I change the military? I can't give you tanks. I cannot give you jets. I cannot buy you guns or military boots but I can give you education, education, education. Again, we wanted to cry, you know, take our handkerchiefs and, you know, <laughs> and we applauded him because that was very, for us, that was okay. That's what he said. No jets, no tanks, education, education, education for generals, education. Okay, very exciting. I know, I, I, you don't feel it in the room right now. Again, the, <laughs> the anti-climax, unfortunately for our story, that in December he was replaced by his deputy. So you need to start from scratch. It's all very personal. You don't know what the new chief is going to think about design. If he wants design, he's coming also from the special operations community. We'll have to wait and see. But in a sense, we're going to start over. Okay. So one of my favorite quotes. Theory is not like a pair of glasses. It is rather like a pair of guns. It does not enable one to see better, but to fight better, okay? So we tell our generals, leave your guns at home or at the bunker or whatever, at your safe, and just do theory. Fill your pockets with theory. And then we, came, we come to our final present movie that we're in, Lancaster, February 2019. And I'm going to throw at you some quotes by generals. I'm not going to say from which military. Uh, we're always late, we're always ill-prepared, and we're always frustrated. You are giving us missions we do not believe in. I'm talking about generals. I'm not talking about soldiers. This I'm going to let you read for a moment. <laughs> it's the onion, OK? Remember, it's the onion. <laughs> Last American who knew what the fuck he was doing dies. <laughs> <laughs> and then wait, like, huh? and then he said, 
this is a dark time for our country because the reality is none of the 300 million or so Americans who remain can actually get anything done or make things happen. Those days are over. over. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My strategy is great. My operation, not so much. I need you to teach me SOD because I have been running successful operations for a year now, but I do not think my bosses have a strategy. And the last one, Edward Lutwak, give war a chance. So um, where I think the debate here in our community, um, five points. Should design be detached from document planning? We've covered that. Uh, should design result from a strategy, or is it re responsible for making one? Obviously, I think the red answer. Should design be taught to generals again, or to staff in the middle? You know my answer. I'm a purist. Uh, could there be a universal military design methodology, or must every military and culture do its own thing? I think this, this year, it's obvious it's, that's where we should go, uh, I think, in our exchanges to figure out how it is being done different in every national and cultural context. And is military design relevant to other institutions of practice? We started with Phil Gilbert. Definitely, I think, yes. But we have more to learn on, on civilian design, and they have more to learn on military design. To recap the Israeli SOD, why we went into SOD, and I think every military here should ask the same questions about themselves. Why we're looking for SOD, maybe you don't need it, or design. We had the failure of 1973, again, of the Yom Kippur War. That was failed maneuver. We had the failure of 1982. That was failed strategy. We had the failure of, um, again, 82, Bashir Jemayim. We decided we were going to put a Christian, Maronic Christian uh, president in Lebanon and have a peace agreement with them. Well, we did, and we signed the peace agreement, but then they killed him. Uh, then we have the failure of 2006, failed doctrine. I wrote a paper on it. It's in Archipelago of Design. And then the final one is not a failure. That was an opportunity, again, emergence. One door closes. That was our design consulting in the US through Buzel and Hamilton. But one door open, and that was us going back to the IDF, starting again the general's course because of failed education. Could there be more than one strategy? There can be only one. Could there be more than one operational approach to strategy? Again, I would say there could be only one. Can strategy resort to status quo? No. If the whole point of an operation is to return to the status quo ante, there is no strategy there. It's impossible to do, but don't call it a strategy. And is strategy adaptive or disruptive? A big deal because organizations, societies, institutions, countries, don't want to destroy themselves in order to recreate themselves. So I'm, I'm talking to people, also government agencies, who are telling me that they needed to make a choice when they started the strategic process. They needed to, to choose whether to adapt, do something evolutionary, or do something which is disruptive, and they chose to do something adaptive, and they call it strategy, I say, impossible. If you don't destroy something, you cannot create something new. Again? the Israeli thing. And finally, just a couple of, uh, again, points to, to think about to recap. Um, definitely, again, for us, systemic operational design or strategic operational design, how we call it right now, it is culturally dependent. Design is the guerrilla movement of the mind. Someone already said it today. I'm happy. I mean, definitely the guerrilla movement of the mind. Uh, again, in Deleuze and Guattari's term, state apparatus versus the war machine. Design is the war machine of the military. You, cannot, you can only go beyond doctrine and do design if you have a solid doctrine. Design is not replacing doctrine. And we need, we need to grow out of this uh, debate. Knowledge that is not socialized cannot be weaponized. And then military design is about systemizing intuition in order to turn it into strategy. And finally. Uncertainty is not a threat if the mind is ready to adapt to new things. So the greatest threat to Colombia, in effect to any country, is resistance to change. That's it.
Thank you so much, Shafra. Uh, so I'm going to take some uh, questions to launch the, the discussion. A anybody wants to uh, jump in? Or we can go and have gin because I'm good on the gin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's the best way to have. Uh, that's actually how I, I interviewed uh, my best conversation. The, first time. <laughs> the second time. Bribe third me time, with alcohol. Fourth time, and I'll the fifth answer. time. Sixth go time. Ahead, Chris. Chris. <laughs> yeah, um, for, uh, if, if systems is the backdrop, and you say there could be only one strategy, uh, what happened to equifinality? Explain. Equifinality means you can have many, many, many different approaches and achieve uh, a change, a desired change even. I'll give you two answers for that. Uh, or, one, organic one, systems. Again, I'm really, I'm a puppy with one trick, OK? So I like to quote Wesley Clark from uh, the post-Kosovo <laughs> post affair. And when he was asked by a journalist, why did Milosevic capitulate? I'm sure most of you have read it. Why did Milosevic capitulate if the air bombing did not, you know, did not decide him militarily? And remember his Wesley Clark's response? You'll have, I don't know. You will have to ask Milosevic, and he's not going to tell you. So when we say your design inquiry should yield one strategy, and that one strategy should be embodied in one operation is because the medium is the message. Strategy is a good story. It's a story that you want to tell. It's a movie that you want to make. It's an argument that you are going to stand behind it. If you don't know what your argument is, you're going to put everyone in spiral, your politicians, your um, tacticians, and your enemies. That's Again, that's our argument, and uh, obviously you can decide if to agree with it or not. But we've seen, to, in, in that respect, I would say, again, Israeli, Israeli context. Again, puppy with one trick, Israeli. I'm talking only about Israel, OK? We had Operation Hamas took over Gaza in 2007. We had three big operations in Gaza since. They looked the same, OK? We, we do, every time we go in and we do the same. Not something that I'm proud of, OK? But what was interesting in the second campaign in 2009, that the way the strategic directive was written in the military, it had two plausible outcomes. One, the operation is going to end in a ceasefire. The second was the operation is going to end in decision, operational decision. And the third one was that the operation is going to end with the uh, outside intervention. I mean, basically, the world is going to tell us to stop because we killed too many Gazans or flattened Gaza, which we do. So tell me, if that's a directive that you are given, or that's a directive that you have written as a military, how, how is the operation going to unfold? Is the operation going to unfold to end in a ceasefire? That's a, one kind of operation. Is the operation going to unfold with decision? That's a different kind of operation. And is your friend operation going to unfold until someone else stops you? Maybe you didn't reach your destination? Does it make sense? You, you're confusing yourselves. That's why we think one strategy, one operation, medium is the message. And I want to have a good answer when they ask me why Hamas capitulated. I want to tell them because I did that and that. And that's what I meant that was going to happen. Anyone else wants to ask me questions? Go ahead. Walter's ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Put can, can you elaborate on the little phrase that you passed there that emancipation is war? What do you mean by all that? Well, we don't have Francis Clermont here. <laughs> that was his speech we in, have his video. in Toronto. We have his video. Um, Francis Clermont, he was a, a, a professor, a Canadian professor who presented at uh, Toronto. And he's coming from a humanitarian, he's a, he's a journalist. Used to, be. Uh, used to be a journalist. He was in conflict zones, uh, did some humanitarian um, assistance, uh, aid, was involved. And he came with a very idealist, positivist view of the world and how you liberate. Again, he, he, he was philosophically talking about how you liberate the mind. But he was describing something that was very peaceful and harmonious, not the Chinese harmonious, okay? Harm 
Western harmonious, okay? Everyone is happy, we're liberated. We're doing design, everybody's happy. Everybody feels good, everybody feels intellectual. And then at some point, you know, it was like three o'clock in the afternoon, like we're done hard hours. But when I heard emancipation and, and harmony and peace, you know, it was like, are you kidding me? When people are emancipated, intellectually or physically, again, the dark side, it is war. You are conflicting with the institution, right? With the politicians, with another culture. It, there is a, an emancipation comes with a price. People going out in the street to protest, some of, some of them are paying with their lives. So if you are talking about design as emancipation, again, from doctrine, from the institution, from the bureaucracy, from all these hazards that you've been talk, people have been talking about here in the last day and a half, there is a price. Are you going, are you ready for war? Or do you think that this is a workshop that you know, you're just giving the, you know, your, the people in the organization as ev and everybody's going to be touchy-feely afterwards? No, emancipation is war and to do design is war. With yourself, because remember, Strategy is transformation in four dimensions. First, the epistemological, you change the way you think. Second is your understanding. You change your understanding of the world, a, a new systemic understanding of the emergence. Third, you change your organization. So 75% of transformation and strategy is in the blue side. You do all that to yourself. And then only the last one is you go and intervene and change the world. So emancipation also, for you, again, from your own jails and your own shackles is, comes with a price and you're in conflict. Go with uh, David. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Um, you made a point there, strategy of adaption versus uh, strategy of disruption. That's the hardest one. Um, I agree, it's the hardest. What are you talking about, are you, are you relating that to Boyd's destruction creation or? Um, what do you mean by that, Dr. Obviously, Boyd is one of our heroes. Uh, we teach this uh, article, actually, Destruction and Creation. Um, I'll, give you an, I, I'll give you a non-military example for that, okay? I did a workshop uh, with the uh, Ministry of Health in Israel. And a year ago, they decided they wanted to do, again, a strategic process. You know, it was a new, he just came to the office, you know, and, and they told him, you can revisit the policy for, uh, for health in, the, in Israel. And he made a decision, as I said, I gave, I talked to him without saying that it was him. He made a decision, he was like, okay, I know all the flaws in the system. I know where it's not working on so, on so many levels. We have public health uh, programs. I mean, we're still getting, all of us, all citizens are getting, uh, health uh, from the government, but it's not working anymore. There are a lot of problems. And, and said, so, okay, I did all this analysis. You know, I have all this team of, let's say, designers. And then at some point, I had to make a decision. Am I building a new health system? Or is it going to be, does it have to be something evolutionary? And it was like, and I'm, okay, so what did you decide? And he said, I decided it has to be evolutionary. So he spent one year with the design team analyzing all the problems, the drifts, or why this system is not working, okay? It's, it's, it's failing already. It's failing for a couple of years. They analyzed, again, scenarios, foresight, where it's going to go. One of the insights of where it's going to go is that 80% of health is not produced by the Ministry of Health or hospitals. 80% of health has to do with nutrition, exercising, prevention. I mean, most of, the health most of what the health ministry does is not about prevention. It's about treatment. They're never going to see if, if, if they choose to do evolutionary steps, they can mostly keep their head above water. So that's why I think it's a good example why strategy, if you came to a realization in a design inquiry, the motivation to go into a design inquiry is that the system is failing, that you're not in sync with reality, that it's not going the way, it's not serving, the way you operate is not serving your interest anymore, okay? How can you choose not to change it? 
I think evolution is, is again, it may be, again, maybe here I am being, again, a purist, a positivist, an idealist, but I think we're not willing to pay the price institutionally, personally, in order to gain a new strategy that will give us a desired state, an alternative reality that is going to be more beneficial to us. Beneficial to us. So are you saying uh, evolution didn't bring you there, or? Evolution wouldn't, br evolution wouldn't bring you there because, again, if, if the failure that you're witnessing right now is so strong, right. I, I you have to do something completely different, I, like I Monty Python said. evolution could have brought you there. Well, what happened, you had natural selection. So that's a particular species of uh, health uh, organization that would kind of die off, and another one would kind of evolve or be contingent from something else. So it, it appears that destroyed one species, but the, the populace kind of adapted because you're right. So the majority of your health is from the individual, right? So that's, you know, eating right, you know, um, this is a healthy lifestyle will also improve that uh, health system. I'll give another example then we'll, and then we can continue it later. Yeah. Um, it goes back to emergence. If we train ourselves as institutions, as organization, to look at reality in the emergent phase, not where we're already identifying the shape of a problem, we can do things evolutionary. But if we're too late in you know, hitting stuff which has already become a problem, it's going to be either we're going to go into a war that's going to end in disaster, and then we'll have to change. We know that the biggest, right, the biggest Changes in the evolution of, of militaries were after you know failures. Right. So I think you can do evolution, but then you have to take the emergence part as well. I mean, anticipate a lot more than what you're doing right yeah, now. Yeah, I think we're kind of saying the same thing, uh, whether it's natural selection or adaption or, or destruction. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm just saying be aware of the price. I mean. Oh yeah, there's a, there's a price to pay in evolution. <laughs> oh, a lot of hands. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question. One more qu question? Yeah, and well, you can decide. We, I, okay. I promise I will continue. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll go in the back, and after that, I invite you to just you know, offer a drink to Ofra, and she will continue <laughs> really, I will. during the I old will. night. So, uh, <laughs> no worries. Can you offer us all a drink? <laughs> we'll be getting things no very soon. Yeah. Hi. Um, so, thanks very much for your presentation. I thought it was really interesting. Um, I'd just like to make a comment, actually. Uh, I think that talking about the kind of emancipation concept, um, which I think is kind of akin to talking about like an all and out, all all and out like war and designing for that. Um, I think to to talk about designing for operations and war without respecting the complexity of the world that we live in now, um, and talk about an all out war scenario, doesn't capture the complexity of stuff that we'd be facing in the real world. So theoretically. I agree with you, it's an excellent kind of like mental exercise to do, but I think that the, the future of design is, is whole of government comprehensive approach um, and, it's, and it's respecting the, the, not only our role as the military, but viewing it as a continuum when it comes to di diplomacy, uh, the emergence of the threat, um, as well as the development side of it. And if you do not have a viewpoint from a design standpoint that encompasses diplomacy and development as tools to achieve our military objectives, you are not doing design correctly. So just to be clear, all-out war, you didn't hear me saying these words, because right. all-out war for us is anti-strategy. Yeah. If you came to a point where there is a full-scale conflict, yeah. it's anti-strategy. We advocate the special operations approach, and I'm not going to Jeremiah's debate of where in the spectrum the special operations community is right now, especially in the States, but the special operations as, uh, approach is, right, is, is not to get to this full-scale, right. upfront, regular conflict. So right. That's one thing. The second thing I can say about our general's course is it's half military, half non-military. Mm. So there is no, at the national level, strategy <laughs> is always going to be whole, whole of government, even in Israel. Well. Great. Thank you so much, Ofra. Thank you for listening and for